안녕하세요 and welcome to the first episode of a new series in collaboration with the Korean Cultural Centre in London. My name is Gigi Young and this series will aim to showcase to you the creativity of Korean culture and Korean subcultures. I'm sure many of you are quarantined at home but this video can hopefully help you to discover more about Korean culture wherever you are. I've compiled a list together of things to do, watch, learn, practice and develop during your time at home, starting with this first video of how to get your fix of Korean creative culture. Despite the stigma contemporary art may have, or the difficulty in pursuing it, contemporary art is actually a really good starting point for those who are interested or wanting to venture into art. Now we'll move on to Korean artists you should know. I've picked a few of the most well-known Korean artists who have made waves here in the West. Our first artist that I'm going to introduce is Ping Namjoon or Namjoon Pei. Born in 1932, he is internationally recognized as the father of video art with his work including video sculptures, installations, performances, video tapes, and television productions. He has a global presence and influence and his innovative art and visionary ideas continue to inspire a new generation of artists today. Born to a wealthy industrial family in Seoul, his family actually fled Korea in 1950 at the outset of the Korean War. He first moved to Hong Kong and then to Japan before emigrating to the United States in 1964. He settled in New York City where he expanded his engagement with video and television. In 1965, Peck was one of the first artists to use a portable video camcorder. Many of the artist's experimental, innovative, yet playful work have had a profound influence on today's art and culture, where his pioneering of the use of television and video in art coined the phrase electronic superhighway to predict the future of communication in the internet age. Some of his more famous works include TV Buddha, constructed in 1974, Electronic Superhighway, Continental US, Alaska, Hawaii, constructed in 1995, and TV Garden, constructed in 2000. The second artist I want to introduce is Hegu Yang. So Hegu Yang is a South Korean artist living and working in both Berlin and Seoul. Yang often uses standard household objects in her work and tries to liberate them from their functional context and apply other connotations and meanings to them. She is known for genre-defying multimedia installations that interweave a range of materials and methods as well as historical references. A few of her more famous works include Soul the Wit, Upside Down, Structure with Three Towers, Expanded 23 Times, Split in Three, Constructed in 2015. Handles, constructed in 2019, is a more recent work that looks at Yang's in-depth research into various sources, ranging from vernacular craft traditions to the historical avant-garde, as well as spiritual philosophies to contemporary political events. Three. Another Korean artist that I wish to introduce is Lee Wu-Fan. Lee Wu-Fan is a Korean minimalist painter and sculptor artist and academic. He is honoured by the government of Japan for having contributed to the development of contemporary art in Japan. Liu Fan is recognized for his unconventional artistic processes which underscore the relationship between the viewer, the artwork and the spaces that they inhabit. He came to prominence in the Mono Ha movement, producing paintings with a single brushstroke and then in the 1970s moved towards creating sculptures using industrial materials such as steel plates and rubber sheets combined with stones and other found natural objects. A few of Lee's famous works include From Lines, painted in 1974, and From Point, 1976 to 1982. Artist 4 is Lee Bull or Lee Bull. Active since the 1980s, Lee Bull is a sculptor and installation artist who represented Korea at the Venice Biennale in 1999. Her work questions and probes themes of authority, politics, and society. Her work has been exhibited worldwide, much like the other artists, in galleries such as the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, the Power Plant in Toronto, as well as having had a retrospective opening at London's Haywoods Gallery a few years ago. Some of her famous works include her Cyborg series from 1997 to 2011, which explores fears and fascinations within the uncanny. Additionally, untitled Cravings White, constructed in 1988 and reconstructed in 2011, sits at the Tate. 
The final artist on my list is Doho Sa. Doho Sa is a notable sculptor and installation artist. He is best known for his complex structures and media works. He currently lives and works in New York as well as his hometown of Seoul, commuting regularly between the two. As a result, the theme of migration has often been prevalent in his works. His pieces also analyse the idea of site specificity and scale and how we as viewers occupy space. Some of his most famous works include Bridging Home, created in 2010 in Liverpool, and New York Apartment, created in 2015. The first film that I want to introduce or recommend to you is Kukantikop, or Extreme Job, which goes into the genre of comedy and action. The film is based on a group of narcotics detectives who work undercover in a chicken restaurant in an attempt to try and bust a gang of organised criminals. Things, however, don't go the way they plan when it turns out that their rundown restaurant becomes the best or the hottest restaurant in town. It becomes the map dip of the town. I can't say too much more without spoiling it, but this definitely has multiple comedic moments and is good for all the family, especially if you like undercover stakeout films. The film also marked an incredible achievement within Korean cinema as it surpassed 16 million people, totaling sales of 137.7 billion Korean won. The film is directed by the beloved South Korean director Lee Byung-hun, who is not to be mistaken with the actor Lee Byung-hun. Lee Byung-hun is famous for his screenplay adaptations of Scandal Makers in 2008 and Sunny in 2011. His film 20 in 2015 won him the Best New Director Award at the Korean Film Actors Association Awards. The next film changes genre completely by going into drama and looking into society. We have Paishi Kim Ji-young and the English title Kim Ji-young, born 1982. The film is based on the famous international novel Kim Ji-young, born 1982, which depicts gender discrimination regarding everyday prejudices that one might face in a manner that's up close and personal, yet relatable and without too much exaggeration and drama. Kim Ji-young is not necessarily a plot-heavy film, but it's rather an honest example of life for an ordinary Korean woman. I wouldn't say that the film has the aggressiveness or even action of a typical feminist film, of which the film has sometimes been described as, but it's more a realistic interpretation of sacrifice that Kim Ji-young, the protagonist, takes in order to regain her own life and happiness, as well as the impact that this then has on her family, her mental health, as well as friends and society. According to a study made by the National Library of Korea, Kim Ji-young, born 1982, was the most borrowed novel in South Korea for 2019 for the second year running. The book was mostly borrowed by women in their 40s and the number of loans increased by 43% in October when the film was released. We now go on to a different type of drama story that is more a coming-of-age story. We have Bi Sang-yeon or Another Child. This coming-of-age story is shown through the eyes of an emotionally troubled set of two teenage girls whose lives are interwoven when they learn of their family's affair. This film is also actually veteran South Korean actor Kim yun Tok's directing debut that examines this fallout from the father's affair and its impact on the family. If you're a big fan of cinematography, then I would definitely check this film out, partly or mainly thanks to the cinematographer Hwang ki Sog, who is responsible also for working on the productions St. Janet and Avengers Age of Ultron. My fourth recommendation regarding films goes into drama, melodrama, and also rom-com. We have 가장 보통의 연애, or The Most Ordinary Romance in English. The film is about a broken-hearted Taewon who, as the film opens, is dumped by his fiancée a month prior. He has not recovered from the breakup, rather taking it quite negatively, and acts as the living protagonist of a tragedy, feeling regret and remorse. Meanwhile, female protagonist Han Young breaks up with her boyfriend, who, after discovering has cheated on her, realises and decides to believe that the special kind of love that she had previously felt does not exist. They end up working together in the same office, and the story unfolds from there. 
They do have a lot of similarities and things in common, but differing opinions on love. The film is a romantic comedy, but it's grounded firmly in reality, showing why each character failed at romance. Now on to my final movie recommendation, which is Malmoi or Malmoi the Secret Mission, which goes into drama and historical drama. The film is set during the 1940s when Korea was under Japanese occupation. To give a little context about the film and the time of the setting of the film, the Korean language at the time was being demoted in status and significance before being banned in 1938 in favour of the Japanese language as controlled by the imperial government. So, the story follows Kim pan Su, played by veteran actor Yu Hae-jin, who's illiterate and does not know how to read or write Korean. After meeting, he then subsequently joins members of the Korean Language Society, who join forces to publish a dictionary of the Korean language. The Joseon Mao Pei's Hajong. The characters themselves are based on real life scholars and members of the Korean Language Society who continued to work on the dictionary even after the ban was enforced. In 1942, more than 30 of the group were arrested and imprisoned by the Japanese, and two died in prison. It was only after when Korean gained independence from Japan in 1945 that the Korean Language Society could resume their activities and create the dictionary. This film is probably the most different from the other films that I have mentioned. It also made me very fortunate as somebody who speaks Korean and learns Korean but living in a foreign country who lives in the West that had these people not risk their lives to save such a language and a culture that perhaps we might not be speaking it here today. And there you have it. Those were my recommendations for Korean contemporary visual arts and Korean contemporary cinema. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the first of hopefully many more videos to come and do let me know what other sorts of content that you might suggest I look into. I am also very keen to return to this series hopefully in the future where I explore lesser known galleries, lesser known films, less mainstream artworks, less mainstream artists, so do let me know in the comments below whether that's something I should look into. I do have a list of other sectors that I will be exploring and recommending to you very shortly as well as lots of ideas for new content where hopefully I get to meet and discuss with creatives themselves in the future. Do leave a comment and thank you so much for watching. Speak soon. Annyeong!